Greetings. It's very good to have you all here today. Thank you for so much for coming out. We're, we're, um, this exhibit has a very special meaning to me and I'm sure many of our team here because as the new director coming here mid-2013 and we were, I was looking at the exhibits that were scheduled and I wanted to do a David Bradley exhibition. And thankfully our exhibit committee went along with, with that and I'd like for David to stand up and be recognized and to thank him for this wonderful, wonderful exhibition. Thank you, David. We don't have all of our numbers uh, totaled through this time yet, but I am, uh, have a pretty good guess that we have uh, about 60,000 people have seen this exhibit. And it's been just wonderful, and we've had some wonderful products that go along with that. And I want to thank our marketing director over here that has really uh, done a great job in marketing this exhibition. We've got a lot of press on it, so we're really, really very thankful. As I was thinking about today and this show coming down on Monday, I was just a little bit sad because it's so vibrant and so colorful. And we were, when we were thinking about what we could do uh, as we began to take the exhibit down, we wanted to do a special tribute to, to David and have his friends here and his band and have them play music and talk about their experiences with him. But he said no, so we honored that. <laughs> he said, no, I don't, I don't want that. And uh, then shortly after that, we lost one of our dear colleagues, John Trudell. And so today I was thinking about John Trudell and the work that David has done and a lot of other, our other artists, what they have done. So I, um, I don't wear, wear red, but I decide to wear red today to um, honor our ancestors that lost their lives in Wounded Knee the first wounded knee, and to thank those that were in uh, the second wounded knee let the, that helped let the world know the situation that we as American Indians live in the current situation in this country. There's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of social issues, and there's a lot of injustice and racism. So I was thinking about John Trudell and all of his contributions and what he sacrificed. He said his family was lost. Well, you saw the film. Um, he gave up a lot, but he continued to fight to make a better world for Native Americans. And I know that you know the messages he carried forth in his his writings, his films, his music. He accomplished a lot, and he helped us all move forward as a people because we got where we are today on the backs of our ancestors. So we owe a great deal to our artists, to David Bradley, and the messages that he sets forth and presents in his art. And we have, I see Bruce King here, and Frank Buffalo Hyde, America Meredith, and um, Mr. Cate. So thank all of you for the messages that you present and what you deliver to people about who we are as Native people and also sharing with the world what the what some of the things that exist there out in Indian country, the problems, but also the humor, the humor that, that uh, Native American people have. And as the director here, one of my, I feel my responsibility is to help engage this museum more with Native people to get more Native people in here, but also the non-Native people want to learn more about Native people, and the way they can do that is to meet artists and hear firsthand what artists have to say. So I've tried to do that, and I think with the, the David Bradley show was you know, a good manifestation of that. We'll continue to do that and have more Native artists in here for you to listen and see 
and discuss and learn about Native arts and culture and history. So thank you once again for joining us today, Jane. And I want to thank our panel for, for accepting uh, to, to uh, be here with us today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And if I could ask the panelists to have a seat. So I'm going to start off with the bios for our panelists today. And, and uh, then we'll be looking at the images that are on the screen here. Uh, I'm going to start off with Frank Buffalo High because his bio is in my phone. Frank Buffalo High believes it is the artist's task to define the times they live in, not just describe, but to reflect and comment on, enriching the conversation between cultures. Recognized as a leader of the contemporary Native art vanguard, Hyde is critically acclaimed, often written about, and collected by important museums as well as private collectors. His latest work is an investigation of popular culture and technology, and how each is a means to to view reality and how we are changing the way we see. America Meredith, raise your hand. <laughs> Frank, raise your hand, everybody knows. America Meredith is the publishing editor of First American Art Magazine, a visual artist, and an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation of the great state of Oklahoma. Exactly. <laughs> she curated numerous socially engaged art shows, including Freedom of Information, the FBI, Indian Country and Surveillance, Fry Bread and Roses, Art of Native American Labor, and the annual Bay Area Anarchist Book Fair art show. Meredith has taught and guest lectured in uh, Native Humanities courses. She was a labor organizer for the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, the ILWU, Local 6. Meredith has also volunteered for the Intertribal WordPath Society, Food Not Bombs, Earth First, International Workers of the World, Kiwatasani Foundation, and the San Francisco Bike Messengers Association, and has organized bike races, concerts, art shows, marches, and rallies, and produced flyers, logos, newsletters, t-shirts, designs, patches, comics, murals, and even a paper mache turkey for these organizations. <laughs> And now, Dallin, you'll raise your hand. Probably everybody knows Dallin, too. Dallin was raised on the Cataraugus Indian Reservation in western New York, home of the Seneca Nation of Indians. Dallin comes from a long line of well-known bead workers, including Bob Spoonhunter, Agnes Logan, and Rebecca Maldonado. And his brother, Ken Williams, Jr., is also a renowned contemporary bead worker. In addition to being an award-winning artist, international performer, and lecturer, Dallin has a Juris Doctorate from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. Dallin's work is in several public and private collections worldwide, including the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. He does this with the support of his wife, Naomi Maybe, an attorney, beadworker, and dancer. Dallin is the father to two beautiful girls, Persephone Singing Water Maybe and Penelope Ojis Dondonjase Maybe. My apologies if I pronounce that poorly. Uh, as well as a talented son, Sage Graystorm, maybe. And Ricardo Cate. Okay. Uh, Ricardo Cate is from Kewa, uh, Santa Domingo Pueblo, and he has found a, a niche for himself in the art world of Santa Fe. He draws and paints cartoons one panel at a time and was picked up by the Santa Fe New, Me New Mexican, the local paper of the state capital here in Santa Fe. Uh, his cartoons are seen by 60,000 readers daily, at the very least, um, and he's close to having 4,000 of them published. Um, hopefully it won't, this won't be true for long, but he's the only native cartoonist featured in daily mainstream newspaper and he has a book of cartoons that's been published as well. So please welcome our panelists. So as we were prepping for, uh, for the panel and we were talking out in the hallway, uh, everyone spoke about how the, 
the history of John Trudell and the very moving film is, is a difficult um, thing to follow and to claim for ourselves as activists. And I know all of our, our panelists have trepidations about that and want to honor David Bradley and John Trudell as part of this. Um, I also want to say sometimes it feels like just getting up in the morning and leaving the house is is an enormous act of will. And I want to also honor everyone here in the audience. We could be doing anything right now. We could be at the grocery store. We could be making chips and dip for a football game. We could be shopping. But we're here talking about art, looking at art, thinking about art and activism. And that in itself is activism too. Coming here and being part of this and being part of the community is a form of activism. Activism looks many different ways and I want to honor all the ways in which activism can appear from subtle things, everyday things, to large actions. And with that, I'd like to turn over to America Meredith, who has some images. Yes, please. It's just nice to have something to hide behind. <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of threw this together quickly, but um, those, those stories from John Trudell, I mean, I had to get up and leave because I was crying because, um, I mean, I think we all grew up with those stories. My father, um, during that time period, he worked for the, he was the Episcopalian um, Indian office. So he um, was kind of behind the scenes, in for phone calls, talk to the, talk to the press, um, bail people out of jail. That was what he did. And, um, you know, um, there's a, I have a lot of questions about that time period, but um, you know how uh, neurologists study the time between your zero and seven. That's pretty much where the imprints in your, um, in your personality is developed. That's pretty much your chart for the rest of your entire life. So I think uh, I naively thought before I moved to Santa Fe, I'm like, yeah, my generation, we're the kids of Wounded Knee. We're all going to be so radical. <laughs> as artists and yeah not so much but anyway my personal story I grew up in Cherokee Nation and Oklahoma and Muskogee Creek Nation and um, um, you know I was always very interested in the environment very interested in you know speaking out and um, moved to San Francisco um, and was part of you know coming from Oklahoma to San Francisco you're not so used to homeless people everywhere so I immediately became involved with uh, food not bombs and I was semi-homeless myself um, and um, my household and two other households started East Bay Food Not Bombs, which is still continuing today. And I don't know if you're familiar with them. It's actually illegal to feed homeless people in San Francisco, as it is in many um, cities, which all our food was vegan, so there was no danger of like dairy or meat contamination. And it's kind of interesting how compassion is outlawed in a lot of the United States. And there's an activist tourism where you should liberate yourself. You know, if I went to Africa and tried to help this village, I would not help, you know, because I don't know the, the material on the ground. And I always thought labor was so boring. You know, when I was a teenager, I'm like, oh God, a labor, you know, so lame. But, um, you know, there's the activism, tourism of liberate yourself. So I think that one of the most important things I've ever done in my life that I've been involved with was uh, as bike messengers trying to unionize bike messengers. And we'd always talk about it. Um, the service workers union who uh, organized the strippers in San Francisco, well, the strippers organized with them. They wouldn't work with us. They're like, you guys are too crazy. We can't go there. So the ILW did actually, they stepped in. And um, they're amazing. But what I saw, ultimately, um, the movement, we did organize a couple companies, but just the the economic cycle, you know, has changed, so bike messengers aren't as viable as they used to be. But what I saw was people being proud of who they are. If you're a bike messenger, you're a loser. You're a fuck up. You know, something has gone horribly wrong in your life if you're a bike messenger. So I saw people um, fight, um, fight against uh, the labor laws, fight against the owners of the company, win lawsuits. Um, we came together, and I saw people being proud of themselves and seeing that transformation, seeing people believe in themselves and believe in each other um, was just really incredible. That changed my life, and I'm really proud of it. This is me in another life form. Um, 
And um, every movement has a lot of art, you know, t-shirts, I wore my little t-shirts. And I don't get a lot of arguments in uh, Santa Fe from what is art and what isn't, but back in San Francisco, I went to the very pure, um, I got my MFA at San Francisco Art Institute, and they would be like, oh no, that's design, that's graphic design, or oh, that's propaganda, that's not art. And I kind of miss those arguments. But um, one thing visual art can do is uh, tell histories, unknown histories, and kind of bring connections. And I think humor is incredibly important. I think, you know, most Native peoples have discovered humor is the survival tool. And also, to we're constantly trying to convince people that don't agree with us. We're the minority. So you use humor as a way to, um, you know, kind of cut through people's uh, defenses. So this is a, um, a historical story that I heard from my dad about how when Alcatraz was going down, the longshoremen took every empty uh, boat on the western seaboard and brought it down to Alcatraz so people could come and go from the island unseen. And they provided water, and they provided electricity, and they provided trucks on the island. And uh, the ILW people I talked to about this, they didn't even know that that was part of the history. That history was completely uh, forgotten. So there's my hyper-realistic um, blue Bambi uh, delivering water to the island. Um, and this ended up in the collection of um, Wilma Mankiller, so I was really, I have no idea where it is now, but I was really proud that she owned it and she cared about it. She was part of that, and also, um, if you know Adam For Fortunate Eagle, he was a longshoreman too, so there's this kind of forgotten history. And, um, you know, again, using humor kind of coming out of left field, um, and also trying to engage people. Um, I really like what John Trudell said about, uh, Power, negotiating power and authority. Um, is anyone here familiar with the work of Earl, uh, Earl Shores? No, uh-oh, okay. Well, he, he used similar terms, but basically, how do people get out of poverty? He did this um, major multi-year study of poverty in America. Richards for the Poor completely recommended it, and um, basically, the people that get out can negotiate uh, power as opposed to force. And um, he saw this in the civil rights movement with the black churches, there's that organization. And all the native uh, tribes, you know, obviously we, a lot of us still have our traditional uh, power structures and we have our IRA structures or our contemporary uh, tribal governance. Like um, with uh, Cherokee uh, stomp dances, one of the things, um, any position of authority at a stomp dance, there's two people that fulfill that position. So someone gets sick, there's someone else. I think that's really important. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'm, I'm babbling. I'm nervous. But anyway, um, when I was a young student, um, I really wanted shows. And unfortunately, one of the student shows at OU was uh, at um, Sea Abdomble Museum, which at the time was one of the least compliant institutions with NAGPRA. They had um, 6,000 human remains. And it's not a large institution. And I'm happy to say everything's changed now. So I really wanted the show. So I just ended up doing a piece about you know, non-compliance with NAGPRA and having human remains. And that's how I became friends with uh, Suzanne Harjo, Sean Harjo, who's a friend of many of the people at this institution. It's a terrible piece of art, it's student art. But anyway, she asked me to do some illustrations for the book, so this is the same idea presented in maybe a more refined way. And then, um, yeah, and you know how artists are supposed to have elevator conversations, you know, like, oh, well, what do you do? I'd be like, oh, I do art about repatriation. And boy, you can get people to clear a room really quick with that. <laughs> and I was surprised when, um, you know, uh, Prop 1A came up in San Francisco. In California, it was, um, you know, just basically accepting the fact that Native tribes have the right to game. Um, and I was surprised that the labor movements were against it. So I'm like, oh, well, I gotta solve this problem. So I, I, and you know how it is when you don't know you can't do something if you don't know, if you just, if you're so dumb, you're like, oh yeah, I can do it. So I did a three state um, traveling touring art exhibit out of my credit card, went $7,000 in debt. But this was fry bread and roses, so I brought together native people and um, you know, had them discuss their role in the labor movement and just work in general, attitudes towards work. Um, and there's a young boy representing the fry bread and roses. So it opened in San Francisco where labor, 40% of the force is labor, and um, I don't know what the percentage of people are native, but very small percentage, so the natives are exotic. Took it to Oklahoma where unions are exotic. Everyone's Indian, but it's like, what the hell's a union? And this was in a chapel. I love, I, I used to be like, oh, I can do an art show anywhere. It was in this weird chapel on the grounds of the Cherokee Heritage Center. And then we took it to Michigan, and that was a perfect storm because, uh, um, oh, Lord, the Gun Lake Potawatomi, I know they have a different name. They were, um, there was all this discussion about the Gun Lake Potawatomis, and they're building this casino, and that's jobs, is that good? So it, this, like, it hit the perfect place. We had the perfect audience. 
and just some of the shows. And um, Suzanne Harjo ended up with this as kind of a psychological portrait of a... Uh, of, you know, being, it's of my father, um, you know, going to Washington, D.C. and being idealistic and being a dreamer and, um, you know, being told, you know, don't, don't do this, you know, you're a failure, don't, you're gonna fail before you try. So it's just like facing the naysayers. And, um, you know, I don't know how you guys view activism, but I think the stereotype is, you know, the young, you know, radical, you know, standing up against the cops in a protest. And that's valid and that's important to get out and be seen. But I was thinking more and more of like, you'll never get what you want if you only define yourself what you oppose, what you're against. That's why I'm like, my friends, stop talking about Donald Trump. Can we move on? The more you talk about him, the more power you give him. So I did this piece and I'm really happy. It's a sunflower seed and it's based on a Caddo story. The Caddo's emerged from the underworld with sunflower and pumpkin seeds. Um, so I'm really happy that painting ended up with a Caddo family, but um, I made these into plant. I did a whole series of plant things because I'm always like, okay, how do you get art out of the gallery? How do you get it in places? This is the evil Oklahoma State Capitol. Um, and that's always a phrase of really like the meek shall inherit the earth. But um, this is so out of order. But anyway, and um, I used to do um, the, I curated shows all the time, but uh, I curated the anarchist, Bay Area Anarchist uh, Book Fair art show. And I've never seen a group of people take art more seriously, like study it. It was unbelievable. It was really gratifying. This is a group, if I hadn't moved away, I would have worked with these people forever. And Ward Churchill was always there. I'm, I'm very ambivalent about AIM, and we got to remember, Ward Churchill was in AIM. So I'd always have a big old Cherokee flag, like, what's up, dude? And um, again, getting, um, getting out our, uh, art out into the streets in the best ways, murals. And this is, I don't know, is anyone familiar with a Clarion Alley mural project in San Francisco? So this is Sycamore Alley. This, is, um, this isn't a bad neighborhood. This is the worst neighborhood. It's a shooting gallery. It's um, full of junkies, essentially. And another group painted uh, Leonard Peltier. I always call it Precious Moments Peltier. But um, just the fact that you can take art and you can tell, you can kind of uh, give a mirror back to community. You can reflect back to them and you can tell their, their own history. I just think murals are amazing. I wish more were in Santa Fe. And this blurry line between, um, you know, fine art. So this is just a painting, but then it became the logo for law, the um, Pan American Indian Humanities Center. And this is back to Earl Shores. I didn't think we'd have a lot of time, so I'm trying to cram in as much as possible. Earl Shores, when he was studying um, poverty and studying the groups that could get out of poverty, there were people that knew how to negotiate power. And he's like, okay, how do you learn how to negotiate power? Studying humanities. And he maintained that um, when they took logic, History, art history, um, um, diplomatics—all these, all these things that are kind of considered superfluous. When they took those out of the curriculum, they knew what they were doing because these are the things that give us skills to reflect and think and consider and, you know, just be logical, make our own choices. So he developed a program, and then he worked with my father, and they developed tribally specific um, native humanities programs where they would study Western, uh, Western humanities, like study Plato, like what was Plato talking about in the Republic, and study how these governments came about and compare that to the individual tribe and work in the language too. So they wanted this because it's a Rufus hummingbird, which has a migratory pattern from Mexico all the way to Alaska, which is insane. So, and they're also uh, hummingbirds birds in um, Noir society are, uh, they're warriors, which if you've seen hummingbirds, that's really apt. They are little warriors. And then this was um, for FBI, um, Freedom of Information. When I asked my dad about the AIM days, he's like, well, when I die, you can call the FBI and use the Freedom of Information Act to get my file. And I'm like, okay, you're super creepy, dad. But um, there's the Episcopal Church, there's our little car, there's our little house, we're eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And in the old days, like, now with all the surveillance and spying, I'm like, yeah, pretty much everything Indians have gone through, the rest of the world will get to go through sooner or later. But in the old days, you know, our phones were tapped. We could hear agents having conversations. My dad had tales. And the craziest thing is he was completely nonviolent. He was um, an historical observer, and he had to rethink his position because the person in the Chicano movement, you know, the Brown Berets, um, in his equivalent, she was given a life in prison sentence. So he had to really think about that, you know, because he has dad, he has kids, and he went into historic preservation for the state of Oklahoma. So he's like still trying to do what he's doing, but in a sneaky way. So that's kind of what I grew up with. And I was so happy by the artists that, are, I mean, to me, Terry Greaves is just like, oh, I'm not worthy. The fact that she was willing to be in the show, and she's talking about, 
And that's a little teeny um, beaded buckskin, but she's talking about how social media is our communication now. And, um, you know, looking at Arab Spring and how Twitter really, you know, that now we have a dem democratic way to communicate to each other that's decentralized um, throughout the entire world. And that's amazing. That's revolutionized everything. And there's Suzanne and all these who's who's. It was a great event. It was really hoopty. I do really hoopty art shows. But um, just for community building and sharing ideas, I think it was really important. Before leaving San Francisco, um, I kind of love idealists, even if you're like, yeah, that's not going to work. But um, I met a group of people and work with them that were trying to unionize um, erotic service providers in uh, San Francisco. So I'm like, God bless you. You know, <laughs> you're awesome. So I developed a logo for them. And again, it's just trying to think about um, think about ideas that we're familiar with in different ways. And there's more of that. And there's me. I like crashed a tea party here in, in Santa Fe. <laughs> so I don't know. I just think humor, humor, and showing up is really, really important. And using art, you know, I, sometimes I mean the thing is, humor also lifts us up when um, things look so dark. You want to give up, and you can't give up. So, and you can't ignore. You can't stick your head in the sand. You know. So I just think um, approaching things creatively, uh, you know, trying to look at things from a different angle is the way we succeed. That was a great transition to Ricardo Cate. Would you like to come up to the podium and show your images? Um, no, I, I, I can just sit here. Is this? Okay. Great. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm going to um, use the sign on my chair and be somewhat reserved. <laughs> about, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I was just going to let um, my, my uh, cartoons speak for themselves. And basically, uh, I haven't been really, uh, as far as activism is concerned, until uh, last year on January 24th when 57 Lakota students were doused with beer at a hockey game in, uh, um, in Rapid City. And uh, when I saw the story and the lack of uh, um, um, attention to this story, everyone was more talking more about the natives who walked off this Adam Sandler film and it reached worldwide. Um, Everyone in the world was talking about this, and, and nobody was listening to this story about the 57 kids. And so uh, that's when I started. And I have a few of uh, those cartoons. But basically, I'm just going to show you what I do. And then I guess the question and answer section, you can, you can ask me about some of these things. So um, well, this, this, this cartoon, you can't really see it because uh, they had to make them smaller because we're sitting up here. But he, basically, the general. And the chief are my two main characters. And the general is asking, do you guys celebrate Independence Day? And the chief says, no, you guys are still here. Um, this is one of the more popular ones. Someday, son, none of this will be yours. Um, and this is me um, drawing about the uh, um, mascot thingy. And so uh, I've, I've drawn several things about the mascots and uh, uh, even the Redskins where he says, uh, we as natives have decided to let you keep your uh, Redskins name. However, this is your new mascot, the Redskin Potato. Um, uh, this one is my take on Columbus. Uh, this is the one I did for uh, Indian Market about three years, four years ago. And uh, it's, uh, it was one of my bigger paintings. And, uh, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, oh, the muddled masses. And this is one of the first cartoons I drew of the kids. And down here it says January 24th, the excited students from American Horse School of at Pine Ridge Reservation on their way to a hockey game, because they were in, um, rewarded for their great work at school, and so uh, they were taken to this hockey game. And somewhere in the third quarter, I guess uh, because a couple of those kids, and they were aged nine to thirteen didn't stand for the, 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 the um, national anthem for some reason. I mean, they're kids. Um, uh, then uh, this privileged box from above them, um, uh, I guess in the third quarter, they started getting uh, inebriated, and they started pouring beer on these kids to, and told them to go back to the reservation. And so I pictured this to be the, the trip back home, total silence, because basically um, Justin Portbear, who was one of the... Um, um, uh, what do you call those? Um, uh, 
well, he he was on the trip with them, and and that basically that's what he said. And so uh, that this was a Saturday night. I didn't catch one of this story until the following Wednesday. And so uh, anyway, just to make a long story short, the guy uh, the guys who did it uh, they only caught well one of the guys, and uh, they slapped him instead of uh, fifty seven counts of child abuse. They slapped him with um, disorderly conduct. And even that was dropped at the end. So he didn't even, uh, nothing really ever happened from this, but um, people are still working on trying to, um, uh, um, how do you say, um, I have a hard time with words. But, uh, but basically they're gonna, um, they're really trying to, to, to uh, uh, bring this out in the, in the open. And so um, justice was very slow. And so uh, basically in the last year, I've been drawing most of the things that I, I feel strongly against or for uh, on, on Facebook. And you won't see them in the, in the cartoon section of the New Mexican. Um, and so there was maybe about 20 cartoons I did, but I just, I just, um, I just did this PowerPoint uh, real quick up here. There, there's three different forms of child abuse. Um, uh, I can't really read them from here, and uh, but the last one is is uh, pouring beer on on kids, and I just uh, question disorderly conduct. Uh, I poked fun at the the not fun um, uh, the way people were dealing with the refugees uh, just recently. Um, and this is just my support for uh, for a, a movement that started out east. Uh, this was, and then I get to have fun, just to just to have fun, and say that Dennis Banks and <laughs> Russell Means uh, brush their teeth with AIM toothpaste, or uh, corn on the cob, cream of corn, corn niblets. She doesn't anyone have anything besides corn, and so uh, this is a t uh, one I did back in 2005 when Vine Deloria passed away, and he wrote the book uh, God Is Red. And God is getting up to greet him, and he says, I knew it. <laughs> uh, this is just recently because of all the Star Wars hype and what the chief thinks about Star Wars. Um, and basically, that's it. Uh, like I said, um, I, I only started recently doing this be, because of uh, um, the power of social media, and, and I, I like to continue... And I wish I had seen uh, the, the, the whole film, the entire film. And it was very moving, the, the first and last part that I saw of Trudell. And I hadn't heard of him until, uh, in all honesty, till uh, March, late March, or no, middle of April, um, when I was asked to do the um, commencement address at Cal Poly uh, in California because he was scheduled to do it. And because he couldn't make it, they asked me to go in his stead. And that's the first time I heard of Trudell and uh, started, you know, I looked him up and started reading some of his material, some of his music, and uh, uh, and then and then he's gone. It's, I, I thought that was pretty tragic, and and um, I, I was kind of in the mindset of trying to meet this guy uh, at some point. Um, but anyway, um, I was talking to uh, Pishan uh, earlier. The one uh, she read the poem earlier. And I was telling her this story, and and she, and she goes, "That's too bad." And she says, "Because I didn't really, you know, uh, really know him till too too well till towards till towards the end." And I said, and and I told her, you know, I I firmly believe that in 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 my language, when when we make a speech and we talk about the culture, and we have a the last ending of the speech goes, um, and this is just um, translated um, roughly, and it says then we can uh, branch out from what we've learned and, and, and uh, the things that have been taught us. That then we can branch out and, and make our own branches, basically, is what it means. And so I like to think that um, even though I didn't know too much of Trudell, I can, I can study and uh, read up on him and maybe, you know, um, take some of my work and, and mesh it with his and make it uh, for people, um, especially kids who are interested in cartoons and... Um, and get his message message across through through that medium, and so um, that's what I feel that I, I I could do, along with uh, uh, many other things. And so, uh, 
even though I'm just right now in this one paper, I'm hoping to, to get syndicated soon. Um, I tried to get syndicated six years ago through King Features, and this was after I had been turned down by the Albuquerque Journal to have my cartoons in there. Um, I went to uh, Kansas, um, uh, Kansas City in Missouri to where uh, the, the syndicate, I, I can't remember if it was King or, um, I, I believe it was King or United, I think it was King. And so I went in the offices and nobody came downstairs, but um, after two hours I left my, uh, my uh, cartoons there and asking them if I could be in their syndicate. And so uh, they wrote a letter to me and, and they said, uh, uh, thank you for submitting, blah, blah, blah. And at the very end they wrote, this country is not ready for this cartoon. And so I wrote back to them immediately, and I thanked them. Thank you for looking at my cartoons. But, and then at the end, I said, I think this country's been waiting 528 years for this cartoon. <laughs> and so that is still, um, that's still how I feel. And right now, I'm just going to try to get this cartoon out to uh, in more newspapers and um, just um, trying to get the message out. And uh, like I said, I'll, I'll talk more about my stuff in the Q&A. Thank you.